Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Thank you so much, Joni, for agreeing to come on the show today and talk about your amazing son. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to talk about Martin. Yeah, Martin is was a great kid, but he had an unbelievably complex medical history. Yes. Yeah. From um, the moment I was pregnant with him, one of my first ultrasounds. Yeah, we kind of knew kind they were crazy something. because I, as I was reading the email that you sent to me, it was like, you started out with one thing and then it moved on to something completely different and then completely different again. And then I just kept thinking to myself, wow, what, what? And now this, <laughs> so, so just to tell the audience, Martin has a really complicated history and we're going to try to probably have to abbreviate things a little bit because I feel like we could probably talk about Martin's medical history for a couple hours in and of itself. And then, then we don't get to talk at all about kind of you and your grief journey and things like that. So we're gonna have to kind of plow through a little bit, but I also don't want to shortchange him because wow, what an amazing guy. Yeah. Yeah. He really was. And, you know, like you said, it was always one thing on top of another, but that kind of just developed the character who he was. So, um, I right. couldn't really imagine life any different. Yeah. But. And he was an amazing kind of kid and just his life's motto and things like that. I found really just inspiring. So why don't you go ahead and just start talking about Martin and a little bit about who he was and his personality. So the audience can get to know him a little bit. Totally. So, um, Martin was born in 2000. Like I said, when I was pregnant with him, um, they found on his first ultrasound that it looked like there were some issues with his bladder and kidneys. Um, he was diagnosed early with, uh, posterior urethral valves, uh, which just kind of meant there was an odd blockage in his urethra, which could lead to, um, some level or severity of kidney damage. They were gonna, they weren't sure what that would look like. And um, just as born. a little reminder, yeah. so the urethra is the, is the little tube that comes from the bladder to go out of the body. And obviously there are normally not any valves there that that's mm -hmm. just a nice stream. So you can just urinate normally, but when there are these valves, then obviously that, that is makes it much less likely to be able to go. And so the urine can really back up and your entire bladder can get dilated and then it can back all the way up to the kidneys and give you kidney damage. So it's a severe thing to have. And in, in utero, before you're even born, actually infants urinate. So they urinate while they're in there. And that's what the amniotic fluid is, is actually those kids urinating. And then when you have that amniotic fluid, that's what babies breathe. So they breathe in and out the amniotic fluid. And so then if you have kidney problems, then sometimes then you're not getting enough amniotic fluid. So then now you have lung problems. And so there are like huge complications that start to mount. So you say a little thing like posterior urethral valves and you think, oh, okay. So that tube's a little messed up. It's not really a big deal, but it really blows up into a kind of a huge deal. So I just wanted to kind of preempt and just tell the audience that because it's funny because now you know that, but right. most people don't know that. So totally. And um, I was really young. I was uh, 19. So I was very naive. I wasn't in the medical field yet myself. So uh, like you said, I was just like, oh, no biggie. But yeah, it's amazing what it can lead to. Mm -hmm. So um you know, uh, all that, um, I ended up having him early just because of those risks, like you mentioned with the amniotic fluid being low. Uh, he was born at 33 weeks. Um, luckily he actually, uh, just 
kind of excelled in regards to lung function and breathing. He was only intubated for a couple hours, um, but they did find out that his kidney um, damage um, was actually pretty significant, um, almost to the point where he had no kidney function. Um, so he started um, uh, the peritoneal dialysis five days after he was born. Um, you know, he stayed in the neonatal intensive care unit for um, almost two months on and off of dialysis because, um, as you probably know, it's easy to get infections, catheters get plugged or uh, plugged up. And um, so there was always kind of one thing happening, but I finally got to take him home and we did dialysis at home. You know, I did tube feedings, um, just, you know, a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, and he did really well. Uh, the doctors were really surprised. Um, you know, they did tell me um, that just with all of what was going on is that, you know, they gave me some statistics of he had about a 50% chance of making it to his first birthday. So when we did get to that first birthday, um, it was, it was pretty amazing. I felt like we kind of could take a, bre yeah. a breath. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the ultimate goal was going to be a kidney transplant. You know, they said that that would get him off of dialysis and hopefully get him to live a, a, a good life. So he did get his kid kidney transplant um, in 2002. Uh, he was a little over uh, one and a half years old. So he was a little guy, um, actually one of the youngest at the hospital that he received that out at that time. And um, he did amazing. Martin always just, you know, breezed right through anything, any procedure, condition. Uh, so, you know, he was two. We, we started to live life a little um, normal for a, mm -hmm. a, a few years. Um, and just, just a great kid. It's interesting when, you know, babies have to go through so much when they're little, um, they just are, are so easygoing. He, he, you know, he hardly ever cried. He just, he took tons of medications every day. I even mm -hmm. had to, um, catheterize him, um, because his bladder still wasn't functioning quite right. So, um, but just, just the best little boy. Yeah. I think, you know, you say that they, they do great. It's, it's actually either one way or the other, because there are kids that I've taken care of that, you know, like heart transplant kids and little kids that have yeah. had lots of stuff and they, and some of those kids just hate everybody too. So I'm glad true, was the true. guy They've that just was going because you said that and I'm like picturing kids in my head who like <laughs> kind of hate me well, and everyone that has a stethoscope <laughs> around their neck. So it's not, uh, right. I, you were blessed. You were definitely, I guess blessed. I was. And I, I feel like, that. yeah, little Martin, we could almost call him Miracle Martin because he just kind of yep. was little, little miracles just kind of kept happening for him, didn't they? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I chose Martin just because I liked it, but then I actually found out that Martin means warrior. So I was like, oh, it was very, that's um, perfect. very meant to be. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. um, you know, kind of speeding up through this process again, Martin, uh, was an amazing kid who loved school. He loved to, um, find himself, you know, just like succeeding in, uh, assignments and grew to love, um, sports, um, a little side note, you know, cause he was born early and he was ill. He had some kind of accompanying conditions. He had mild cerebral palsy, which caused him to not walk till he was four years old. Um, and then he was also diagnosed um, to be on the autism spectrum, uh, very high functioning. So he was, he was mainstreamed, but everything Martin did, it just took him a little more work, but he loved to do it because he loved to see that success at the end. Uh -huh. um, so he actually played um, unified uh, sports, which is kind of a, um, part of special Olympics. Um, it's with kids with disabilities and without on the court together. So okay. he was a rock star at basketball. Um, you know, wasn't the fastest on the court, but he, um, had a good shot and played crazy defense. So <laughs> it was fun to watch him Perfect. do that. Um, junior high came along and like you said, we kind of got hit with something else. Martin was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Um, so that was kind of just something new out of the blue, um, you know, a body system we hadn't had to kind of fight and um, mm -hmm. like manipulate yet. So uh, yeah, you were all, started. you had the kidney stuff down. Yeah. You were like that yes, I yes, got, yes. but yeah. now to all of a sudden your GI tract being screwed up too. Wow. I know, I know. 
So he started some new medications and that seemed to help. Um, you know, he was able to feel better, eat, not feel so sick, go to school still. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was good. Um, you know, he started high school, uh, things were moving along, just, just loving life. Um, he grew a love for choir. So he was a, um, he was a singer and you know that, whole that connection. spot in my heart yes. for sure. <laughs> yes. Singing I've boys. To, I love it. Mm -hmm. I've listened to many of your posts of, um, Andy's, uh, choirs. So oh yeah, God. I just, oh. I love it still to this day. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, choir oh, was so wonderful. Sweet. His choir actually made it to a state competition in his junior year. He was so proud. So it was oh, awesome. Wow. wow. Um, and then he just, we kind of kept rolling along. We, we were, uh, things were just as stable as could be. And we just, I, I look back and I'm just like, oh, I'm so glad we had those years because God, they were great. Mm -hmm. Um, and but, it's great that you can say yeah. that because, you know, he's a transplant patient. So there's all his transplant meds. And then mm -hmm. he's on these Crohn's disease meds. Although there's probably some meds that kind of help both, ironically. Which yes. I, like being on steroids would be kind of good for both things. And there are some things for both. But oh, wow, it's just a lot. It's just a lot to have to go through. And, you know, yeah. when he's already yeah. been through quite a bit his whole life. But I love how he just had such a great attitude for life. Right? I mean, oh, gosh, yeah. Of, dealt a little kind of a lousy hand in some ways, right? Medically, totally. but yet he's in choir, he's going, doing in school. Great. You know, he's just, he really, what a great attitude towards life. Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing that was always, you know, because of his mild cerebral palsy, he still just, he kind of had a little limp and a little swag to his stuff. And, um, you know, he would actually even have to take a hand of his friend to um, get up on the choir, uh, you know, the bleachers risers. that they, mm -hmm. risers, thank you, that they um, sang on. And it's just, he didn't have, you know, it's like he accepted that help and he had no worry of what people would think of him. And I just always said he had so much more confidence than I could ever have, <laughs> right. you know, I would have just probably like, you know, not done anything. I wouldn't want anyone to see me, you know, it's just, he, he was just, you know, he just held his head high and just loved life. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so yeah, high school, we were rocking and rolling. He was, uh, getting straight A's, taking AP classes, starting to think about college. <laughs> um, he grew a love for football, which was kind of ironic always. Cause I, you know, it's not like he ever saw himself Gosh. on the field, but, um, he loved this. I was going to say he can't with his kidney. <laughs> I don't know if people no. know this because I, you know, my foster son has a kidney transplant, but your kidney, okay. when they give you a transplant, it's in your belly. Okay. So people yeah. in general think that they put it back to where kidneys go in the back. So they're protected. No, no. Your kidney just sits in your belly. So you can't do things like play football and do crazy right. stuff like that because your kidney is literally right there. Yep. Right <laughs> underneath the skin. Yeah. Right underneath yeah. the skin. My, my guy, he was so small when he got his transplant that you could actually see it. You could see the little bulge of oh. the kidney for a while yeah. well, because you know, you've got all your intestine and all that stuff in there. Now you try to stuff a whole extra kidney in there. I think for your little guy, you know, getting mm -hmm. it at one and a half. What a belly he must have had on him having that <laughs> extra kidney. In I there. do you remember it was just plump and yep. <laughs> but pretty cute. <laughs> yeah, but like football is a non, you cannot do yes. football. No transplant surgeon would ever <laughs> let you do football after you got a kidney. <laughs> yeah. So so he watched. He, so he, he watched. So he loved it. Following the players. So he grew to fall in love uh, with the Denver Broncos. So we started following them, going to games, um, and he wanted to move to Denver. So his dream was to become a, a sports journalist or broadcaster. So okay. Colorado is, you know, full of sports. So we were going to move there you, after he graduated. Where do you live? We lived in Portland, Oregon at the time. Wow. And so how did the love of the Broncos begin then from, from Portland, Oregon? <laughs> 
Good question. Um, I think he actually kind of just fell in love with the mascot because he was really okay. young when he fell in love with it. And okay. then he just kind of grew um, into just really following him and just, yeah, loving it. Oh, so awesome. actually, um, how, how old would he have been? He would have been 15. Um, we actually took him to Super Bowl 50 in California, the Broncos uh, versus the Panthers. Wow. So we kind of always knew with Martin that um, with just everything he had, that maybe time was going to be a little limited. So right. it came to a point in our life that it's like, hey, if we could do something like this might be it, like this might be our chance. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so we started kind of like get a kidney that young, you, you think, mm -hmm. I mean, they certainly tell you this is not going to be the only kidney. The kidney is not totally. going to live, live a full long life. So, you know, you were probably told to expect probably two or three kidneys if he were to live a long life. I mean, even with Valeriano yeah. getting his kidney at 17, we certainly don't expect this kidney to live as long as we hopefully want him to live, which means right. he will likely at some point need another. So I, I'm sure they were thinking with Martin, it, it would be probably three, right? So yeah. Yeah. We definitely knew there, there would be another one needed mm -hmm. at some point. So. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I'm sure you did, uh, save her life a little bit more than yeah. that average kind of person would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely did. So I I'm, I'm happy with those decisions at the time. Financially, I was like, Oh, can we really do this Super Bowl? But now I'm just like, Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. It was a hundred percent worth it. Yeah. Yeah. But so come, you know, summer of junior year to senior year, he's ready to start his last year, getting excited about those things that all kids do at that age. Um, he started getting really sick, uh, just really weak, nauseous. And, you know, with so much that Martin was already dealing with, we cut the doctors were just kind of like, Oh, you know, maybe it's his Crohn's, maybe it's not being managed as well anymore. Maybe we mm -hmm. need to try another medication. And, you know, that totally made sense. Um, uh, so, you know, we tried a few things that summer, he had to get some blood transfusions and then, um, he was able to make it to the first week of senior year. So he got to kind of have some fun with those activities, but that, um, next week, um, he almost passed out in the bathroom getting ready that morning. So we went to the ER and, um, long story short, he stayed about two, two to three weeks. Um, they worked him up for all kinds of things. You know, they thought he had, um, some type of, you know, blood clots or this mm -hmm. and that. And it was just a, you know, like every day it was something different. Um, mm -hmm. but it, you know, in the end, um, he was diagnosed with lymphoma. So he, yeah. um, yeah, it was a, it was a shock, um, kind of made sense after thinking about it. And then, you know, the, the sad thing was, is, you know, with all the medicines he'd been on his whole life with yeah. transplant meds and Crohn's, that's, that's a risk. Yeah. And so it was, you know, looking back and like, oh, if we didn't have had to do, if we didn't have to do that, if we didn't have to do this, but it's like, right. I guess all, all of those meds are what allowed him to mm -hmm. enjoy those years of life. So right. I have right. to manage that. It's in my hard, mind but bit. you know, that that's what did it. For sure. Yeah. And I can see why he yeah. would be hard to diagnose too, because so much of when you uh, diagnose cancer, if you do some blood work, you see the inflammatory markers and the inflammatory markers can be extremely high in cancers, but they also can be extremely high if you have a flare of your Crohn's disease. And so yeah. all of those same just kind of generic blood tests that they would do you would not be able to really tell the difference until right. you probably did some imaging. I imagine that's how they really kind of discovered things is with, yeah, uh, I looked into things a little bit more and, and yeah, look and see. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, you know, they just said he had some inflamed lymph nodes. And even at that time they yeah. said it could yeah. just possibly be Crohn's like again. Crohn's. So they, yeah. they actually, they said, you know, we got to do the biopsy. We got right. to do the, you have the to surgery. Do the biopsy to, and see. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and it was, and he, you know, again, just one more thing. And he took it with like, Hey, I got this. And, and I, I did too. You at that time, were you, what were you thinking? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just going back I, and I, forth because yeah. I would think in some type, my part of my mind, I would think you're like now cancer and you'd be 
totally devastated. And then on the other time, it's like, yeah, yeah, but he got everything else. I mean, he got the exactly. transplant. He's fine. Crohn's disease can certainly that can kill kids. And he yeah. making it through that doing really well. So then you kind of go, OK, cancer. Maybe we got this, too. So I just totally. where was your head at that point in time? Um, I would just like you said, I was like, yeah, this is no big deal. Like we we've done this before. It's a little, yeah. you know, like a little bump in the road. Like you didn't really plan this for senior year, but Hey, like not a big deal. Right. Because um, he's done everything else because he's miracle Martin. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and and he did too. He was excited. Um, you know, he started his first round of chemo on his 18th birthday in the hospital. Oh, and man. it was just like, you know, the doctors, his doctor's loved him and they sang happy birthday and we had cupcakes up there and it was just it was great it's now that i think back it's just like really good memories i i think mm -hmm. even even through you know cancer treatment so um you know then side note um i was about um eight weeks pregnant at this time marcy yeah. yes. <laughs> with my daughter um we had tried for many years to add um, uh, a sibling for Martin and we had many losses. Uh, we even had a baby who had trisomy 18 yes. and um, mm -hmm. Martin got to actually meet that baby. Um, uh, and But so, how scary to be going through this pregnancy yeah. and to be doing these treatments and all of this stuff yeah. kind of going on at the same time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I really thought that because of the losses, I was like, you know, this stress now. And like, I, I kind of anticipated probably not being able to keep this pregnancy as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I kind of knew that that was a, a chance for sure. Yeah. Um, and you probably didn't want to get your hopes up. Exactly. Yeah. I was just it, one day at a time. And Martin, even back then, you know, he, he was strong, but sometimes he would be so realistic and he'd be like, he said, I just want to meet her. And I was like, you know, of course you are like a stop. Like we mm -hmm. got this, you'll be fine. So he went through chemo. Um, he did four rounds. He was doing online classes, keeping up with his senior year because he wanted to graduate. He had even started a college course um, in um, like a journalism class that he was doing. So mm -hmm. um, which I loved because it just kept him, you know, having that hope that you know, yeah. we're going to make it see the end. And, um, you know, so we, you know, they rescanned them, did some tests and there was really no change. It wasn't necessarily worse or better, but they really just didn't like that. It wasn't better. Yeah. So, um, being that Martin was 18, we actually kind of, they thought that maybe, Hey, maybe we should like treat him more like as an adult. So he started sure. going that round and kind mm -hmm. of was seen by a whole new team. And so we started a, kind of a second line of treatment um, with a plan for like a stem cell transplant. And it was just, you know, the, after the first treatment, I think it was January of like 2019, he, um, just really had significant changes, um, some confusion, disorientation, um, just wasn't, wasn't Martin. Um, so it kind of really scared us like quick and, uh, gosh, you know, we ended up back in the hospital numerous times. <laughs> and so we're there. Um, he actually ends up starting to have um, what they think is a possible GI bleed or blockage. So uh, he gets uh, taken to ICU. He's having to have multiple transfusions. Um, things are just kind of like, you know, getting out of hand. And I think the scariest part is that we weren't even really talking cancer treatment anymore. We were kind of just talking like, how can we maintain what is going on and, right. and you know just like just just simple uh facts and all of this was happening while i was set to um give birth in in march and <laughs> so we were actually in the same hospital hospital my husband joked that he'd be bouncing back and forth from floors but that literally ended up being the truth um so Martin was in the ICU. I was being induced and uh, which wasn't successful as I'm thinking about, you know, my son who is um, hanging on. So my body was like, no, no, no. <laughs> so yeah. I had a C-section with Marley and we, um, Martin was supposed to be there. He was supposed to be in the room with us, with Marley, because he always said that he wanted to be by my side as I was for him, for all of his 
surgeries and procedures. And so the hospital was amazing. Um, I'm a nurse myself, so I, um, I can't even begin to thank the staff and the nurses of what they did in allowing, you know, they wheeled me on a bed um, up to the ICU to see him. And we were by each other's sides for a while. And then right after we had Marley, that was the first place we went is he got to meet her first. Oh. And so oh, at that point, I just like, it was that, um, I was so like proud to be a nurse. Cause I just, it's those moments that like, I hope they always know that like, and that's the kind of care, like, those are the things that people remember forever. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 they are. They are. Yeah. And then for him to get to see her and hold her, I imagine. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 He was, he was very overwhelmed. I think, you know, he was worried, concerned, a little confused, but just overwhelmed with her and just, just loved her so much. Um, so we, we got out of the hospital, Marley did, but we basically went to just go stay with him. Um, and then things went downhill really fast. He actually had to be transferred to another hospital. He was having kind of a massive bleed, needing a massive transfusion. Um, and he needed, um, you know, a procedure. Uh, some of his arteries were kind of being compressed and uh, due to the um, tumors and lymph nodes. Tumors, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, so he, he got the procedure. And then, you know, we were just kind of told, though, that it, this just wasn't going to be kind of sustainable. Um, I was, I was a, a mess, um, you know, just having given birth, uh, all those hormones on top of just kind of yeah. being, being led down the road of being almost told that this might be the end. Was Yeah. And you have this hard. brand new little baby, but then, you know, you're saying goodbye to your own. Yeah. Yeah. So she, um, we went, in a meeting and Martin came with us and he was so strong. And, um, I remember it to this day because it's something that will on the times kind of haunt me, but he was always so wanting me to feel reassured with what was going on. And so he was, you know, they were talking about hospice and, um, he was nodding his head, just yeah. wanting me to know that it was going to be okay. And yeah. so, um, we so amazing what we, kids do they just want to protect their parents <laughs> so much always and, and i'm always. sure he was more worried about you than he was even about himself yeah i know yeah um that was kind of our whole life like i said i was really young so i feel like in some ways martin and i grew up together <laughs> right like he just um we we just were always there for each other um um so uh we, we, we went with hospice, but I felt like, you know, when you have no control in a lot of things, you all of a sudden you want some control over something. So I was like, we are going to go to Denver. We're going to go to Colorado. Like that's where we're going yeah. to hospice. And I said, <laughs> oh you, you wanted, I said, you wanted to move there. We're, we're doing it. <laughs> and the hospital oh was my great. Gosh. Wow. <laughs> They got everything set up and Marley was two weeks old and we were on a plane um, going to, you know, Denver. And he, we got so much support from family and friends and people who didn't even know us, um, you know, gave us air miles and set us up to, he got to be down on the floor of a Denver Nuggets basketball game uh, with the broadcasters doing, you know, what he wanted to do when he grew up. Yeah. And and so he got these moments and granted they were in a short time of almost a couple of weeks, but I got to kind of see his full life kind of compacted and, um, he even got to meet some celebrities on the Broncos team. Um, oh, wow. and it was just, it was amazing. Um, even some of our friends in Denver through a tailgate on a random Sunday, in um march <laughs> and um in a parking lot i i i heard we weren't supposed to be so um we just kind of, we we lived we lived life and marley was there by our side the whole time it was it was the four of us as it as it as the plan so it should be. be yep as yeah. it was supposed to be mm -hmm. yeah so he 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 was doing good and stable and i will tell you i i never gave up hope and yeah, 
uh, faith through the way of thinking, you know, doctors can tell me this and that, but at the end of the day, you know, they, they could be wrong. (laughs) So he had some good days and I was like, Oh, maybe. And then, and he said, he started getting kind of ill. We actually went into a inpatient hospice facility to kind of get him some hydration. He was pretty dehydrated. And so, you know, with, with pediatrics, um, hospice isn't always necessarily like, you know, take everything away. So that was nice. They were even willing to do blood transfusions if he needed them. So, um, uh, it was a great facility. Um, but then, you know, a couple of days there, uh, I was, I was pulled aside by a nurse and kind of told that, Hey, this is probably going to be his last day. And I was in shock and I was thinking like, I'm a nurse myself. And like, what are you saying? I don't see this. And, but then she said, you know, you're, you're his mom. You're not supposed to see that. Yeah. And, and you don't want to see it. Yeah. 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 But I just, I knew at that time though, I was so thankful for her um, to just be so honest. And I was just like, wow, like, how can you do this every day um, and work, you know, tell people these things. And I was just like, okay. Like, But then I told her, hey, we got to leave. Like, I got to get him back to the Airbnb in downtown Denver because that's where he wanted to be. I always kind of promised him. um, I never wanted him to die in any type of a hospital, you know, medical setting. I I wanted him home. And so they got it arranged and we rode an ambulance through Denver. Marley was in the ambulance with us, all buckled in her car seat. And Mm -hmm. because they told us that it's possible he could pass in route. And I said, yeah. I just want us all, all four together. And, yeah. but we got back to the Airbnb. It was the Colorado Rockies home opener. We actually were right in downtown. So we heard the jets fly over and we laid in bed, all of us, and just reminisced about life and looked at pictures and listened to music. And it, I always say it was like perfect. And it's just so odd how you can say that. Yeah, but I couldn't imagine it any other way. And I'm yeah. just so blessed and thankful that like, I feel like we, we got everything we wanted other yeah. than the obvious, <laughs> but if, right. You, the if obvious would have been that, a cure, right? Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And so, yeah, that, that was it. But I just feel like it's just like, you know, it, it, it was, it was great. I, we were together. Yeah. So. Well, I'm glad you were blessed to be together like that. That is, yeah, that is nice to know that you had that in those final moments. And the fact that he got to meet Marley is so big. How long were you in Colorado before he died? Um, not even two weeks, I think almost two weeks. Yeah. You got a lot in those two weeks then, didn't you? We did. Every day was packed. I'm sure we exhausted him, but, but he was always willing and up for any. So So talk about now that time after and what, what that was like and just to share that Um, with your new baby and everything. Yeah. Um, it was, it was interesting because it was just, I couldn't, you know, crawl in bed or, you know, just be by myself. I had a baby to take care of. And, but you know, we, we grieved together. We cried, we enjoyed times with her. So we had like smiles through tears. It was just interesting. And the whole time I kind of always think he was so, Martin was so spiritual that I swear it was like set up that we went, we weren't going to be left with Marley because I think he knew me all too well that I, I love being a mom and I can't imagine not mothering someone here physically. So, um, um, and I, I was happy to have her to see her smiles and, you know, just have a, have a purpose through all of it still. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is really a powerful thing to be able to still have. So one thing that you wrote to me, and I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was a piece of advice that Martin wanted given to Marley. So can you share what that was again? Because I thought, I love that. Yeah, we actually recorded it even, and he was always so up for it. So 
um, we asked him what he wanted her to know. And it was to um, uh, live in the moment. Yeah. And that's kind of the motto of our foundation, uh, the Nitty Strong Foundation. So Nitty was his nickname. Little um, <laughs> side note is that Martin backwards is Knit Ram, like spelled backwards. And so then we called him Nitty. And that's been his nickname for years. So when he was going through his cancer fight, we created the little bands and did that. And it um, was a Nitty Strong. So uh, Nitty strong. we created okay. uh, the Nitty Strong Foundation. And our kind of motto is live in the moment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's we say we say that all the time and we remind ourselves that even sometimes to this day when Marley does something fun and I'm like, oh, shoot, I don't have my camera or like, I wish I had this. And I was like, you know, live in the moment. Maybe it's not meant to be captured, but just like remember it in our minds and heart. Yeah. So, yeah. How old is Marley now? Marley is almost two and a half. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. She's a big girl. She's and a do big you talk girl. to She's her about girl. her brother, her big brother? We do. We do. We have uh, pictures up of him. We were fortunate to get family pictures of when he left the hospital on hospice. I had actually already scheduled uh, newborn pictures and I canceled them. And our photographer wrote me and she said, can I come over and just take some like pictures of your family? Because she knew what was happening. And I was like, it sounded horrible at the time. But I was like, yeah, uh, sure. And now I'm like so thankful I have them. So we have family pictures of the four of us up and she knows his name. She'll see pictures and say Martin or Nitty. And mm-hmm. yeah, because mm-hmm. I guess that's always my biggest fear is like she like, will she will she know him? And my family says, of course, she will, because they talk about him and they're going to talk to her about him. And and she helps us with foundation stuff and she goes to events and I just, I can't wait for her to become a bigger part of that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why don't you talk more about the foundation now and what it does and the kinds of things you've done? Yeah. Um, so we created it right away. Um, uh, that right away after we, he died or even when he actually, was had cancer? They created a Nitty Strong uh, Facebook and website page while he was in the hospital, kind of at the end. Um, And then the foundation was created after. And I think my husband kind of told him we were going to do that. Um, So Martin uh, actually did receive his diploma early and even got to wear his cap. He got to wear his cap and gown before we left for Denver. We had kind of a goodbye party for us all as we were all moving. And, you know, hundreds of people came and he, he got his diploma, um, received it from his choir teacher. And, um, but, you know, of course he didn't get to walk. So, uh, back in June, we, um, went back for graduation. The high school, uh, let me walk in his honor and when his name got called. Um, and it was actually the same high school I graduated from exactly 20 years earlier. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Kind of just bittersweet and sad and happy and odd. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. um, but we actually gave our first scholarship out that year. So it would have been to one of his classmates and, um, it was, uh, the majority of the money was actually money Martin had made at his summer job that summer. He worked at, um, a local kind of, um, uh, triple A type baseball team ballpark. So, okay. um, so that was really good. Cause he was take- getting ready for that. Cause that's what he wanted to do with his life. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Broadcasting. Totally. Yep. Mm-hmm. He was great there. So, um, it was great to give a scholarship to a classmate of his. And then, so we planned, um, so since then we've given out four, uh, scholarships to graduating seniors. Um, another passion of the foundation is to give, um, sports grants and monies to um, youth sports teams that he loves sports so just you know extra things uh, you know equipment you know special uniforms just those things that cost money for these teams out there playing and and things that they normally wouldn't be able to maybe get right because exactly exactly. you've got these yearly fees that you can't you don't want to make them one year like exorbitantly high just because they yeah. need a certain type of equipment. So it's nice to yeah. be able to gift them that. Yeah. Get some yeah. Things. Mm-hmm. 
And then we also kind of do these, like what we call kind of random acts of kindness, just things in the community. Like we just did a, um, like a backpack giveaway. So backpacks full of school supplies to, you know, local kids. Um, so it's just, it's just fun. It's just things that I know that like, I'm sure he's smiling about as we are doing them. Mm-hmm. And it just makes you feel good that like, you know, every day you kind of wake up and there, you know, he's giving you something to still be passionate about and to live in the moment. Right. And to live in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a great thing. I just feel like he's just got such an inspiring story that everyone should hear about. So it's nice that for you to be able to have this foundation and kind of, I think just promote that a little bit too. Right. So other people can get to know him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. We love to talk about him. And it just, yeah, kind of, you know, heals our heart a little Mm -hmm. bit at a time. So you ended up, you ended up moving to Colorado then permanently. We did. We did. We stayed there for about two years. We're in New Mexico now. COVID kind of, you know, knocked us down a little bit, but uh, we stayed in Colorado for two years. Um, And I actually went back to work for a little while and I actually went to go work at the hospice facility he was taking care of. Because I just, I was so passionate about what those nurses did for him. And so my heart will always lie in hospice nursing from here on out. So really, so that's what you, is that's what you feel called to do now? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. How hard was that at the beginning? Was that hard or it it didn't feel hard? It was, it was kind of hard. Um, but everything I kind of, I think my husband and I even say this together is like things that feel hard or situations that are hard or sad. I feel like it's like, it, it's nothing in comparison to like things that he had to go through in life, you know, whether it was like through, you know, medical stuff or procedures, or I just always walk into everything, just kind of say, you know, I got this because, yeah. And again, it's nothing in comparison to losing him. So if I feel a little uncomfortable or sad or, you know, just scared, it's just, I I feel like I've been through the the worst in life. Um, You know, I can't guarantee, but um, I'm hoping, you know, on, you know, an uphill climb from here. So, you know, I thinking after I asked that question about you know, cause it's, it was very hard for me to go back to work after mm-hmm. Andy died and it took yes. close to a year really for me to stay back permanently. But then thinking about it, the hard part was not seeing the really sick kids. That's not the hard part. The hard part mm-hmm. was the everyday stuff and somehow the stuff that no longer seemed that important, you know, even like totally. I, I did administrative work when Andy died and I did it for a while right after, because it was easier than seeing patients. But then after a while, it just didn't feel important. And then Mm -hmm. I just, I couldn't do it because it just didn't mean enough. And I felt like I needed to be somewhere that was deeper and more real. And I mean, even like the podcast, right? What do I do? I talk to bereaved parents. It's like, that's not, what normal people like to do. <laughs> right. It's not what people normal like to talk about. Normal people do not like to talk to people <laughs> whose kids have died. Let's just put it out there. Yeah. It's <laughs> a real thing. Yeah. That's not. <laughs> so then I'm like, I guess that's not so strange that that's what you would be called to do because it's not dissimilar to what I feel like I'm called to do is, is, is standing beside and walking beside bereaved parents. And so you're, walking beside dying people and their families and, and helping them through the hardest time they're ever going to have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. And I always feel like it's, um, you know, through many years of Martin's medical stuff, you know, nurses and doctors and they're caring and some would say, you know, I understand, or I know. And sometimes I would like to say, you know, like, do do you really? And maybe they do. And, you know, they, they've seen it, so they do understand in a way, but but they're not a parent of it, most likely. Mm-hmm. So I 
feel like, you know, I, I love to share. I didn't always share because I, you know, I wanted to care for their person at the bedside who was dying, but right. sometimes it, I did, it felt right to share like, Hey, I, I actually have been where you are mm-hmm. and I, I know this and I, and they appreciated it so much. And I, I, I was going to say, I know I they do. It. They do. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to different people and sometimes people are like, yeah, I don't want to put my own on them because yeah. I don't want to put it on them. And, and I right. completely understand that, but they usually don't take it like that. They kind of take it like, what you, you've done this and you're still getting up every day. How are exactly. you getting up every day? So they are more curious to ask you how you do it. You're not actually bringing them down by sharing mm-hmm. your story. Most of the time you are making it, making them realize wow, she's getting up every day and she's like coming to work and she's doing all of this stuff. That means maybe I will be able to do that too. So actually I think it gives them hope. So I, I feel like it's better to share some of those things. I mean, like not share to the point where you're just sobbing all over them, but (laughs) to the point, if you can be somewhat of an inspiration of, yep, it is really hard and is really terrible, but here I am two years later, still getting up every day and Mm -hmm. still doing this every day. You know, Mm -hmm. I think about something my, my pastor told me in the early days that I didn't understand. And he would say to me, it's a privilege to walk beside you through this. He would use the word privilege. And I use that same word now. When I talk to families about sharing their story, I say, I would be honored to share your story. I am privileged to walk beside you. I recently had a friend who lost her son and I said that I use the same term. I said, I am privileged to walk beside you through this because that is truly what it feels like. It feels like an honor now to be with someone in their darkest and help them. And, and it's not bringing anybody down or anything. It's, it's a sacred space to be there. And when you're with a family who's going through that, when you're in hospice, that, that is sacred Mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. I just love that. So, but now you're in New Mexico. We are (laughs) enjoying the sunshine and heat. (laughs) Well, I don't know about enjoying the heat. <laughs> I'm in Michigan, right? We don't love heat. We, you know, we get a okay. little nervous. If it gets up to 90 in Michigan, we're like, whoa, you gotta, what? you gotta cool off here a little bit. I don't, I don't think yeah. you can handle New Mexico heat. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, yeah. So what are you doing now? Are you doing some of the same type of thing? Or are you taking a little um, break? I or? actually, I am just doing um, kind of as needed work actually mm-hmm. in like a behavioral health hospital. Um, okay. I, I have realized that um, I can't ever return to nursing in, you know, a medical type hospital. It's, yeah. I get a little, you know, things start coming back, sounds, noises. So I just feel like I'm not going to be the best nurse for the patients, Mm -hmm. nor, you know, it's just not a good, um, combination. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to try something that maybe it hasn't really, I've never had to deal with. So, um, you know, I'll have that compassion and I'll have everything that kind of drives you towards nursing. So, um, yeah, I'm just doing a little work in there right now. Um, spending a lot of time with Marley, um, and we kind of moved to New Mexico to kind of, you know, step back from having to work so hard. And um, my husband calls it like an early retirement because we really want to focus a lot on the foundation. So Right, right, um, right. That's what I yeah. was going to ask too, if that was kind of taking up a little more of your time as well, if you're doing a little more with that. Are you yeah. trying to do that locally or is that in Colorado? Is it in Oregon? You know, where where um, are you? It, we always post it kind of wherever, especially when it comes to scholarships, it gets posted on our Facebook site. Um, and so, uh, we're kind of willing to kind of roll with, and we got some kind of random applicants for our scholarships this past year. So it's kind of fun to see how far we can reach, you know, mm-hmm. other Do you have foundation. certain requirements for your scholarships? Are they for certain types of people or? Yeah. Well, we, we, 
we had some tight requirements the first year. We wanted, you know, someone who wanted to go into journalism, you know, mm -hmm. things that Martin probably would have said, but uh, we kind of um, like eased those up a little bit. Um, just a little bit of a GPA requirement. Um, I think 3.0 or above and really just, um, you know, just wherever, whatever you want to study, where it's, it's pretty open now. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and any we schools and things like that too? Any or? schools, uh, trade schools even. Um, and, you know, I think there's some questions that we just ask and we just love to get people's personal stories and kind of read, you know, what these kids have, have gone through in their young, you know, years so far. And it's, it's amazing some of the stories we get and where it's just like, again, it'll kind of knock the breath out of me even after what, you know, I've been through and just be like, wow, like I can't imagine that. So, you know, life is kind of that, interesting. That's hard for me to believe because goodness, I read your story and it knocked the breath <laughs> out of me for sure. So I don't know what you're reading to <laughs> knock the breath out of you. Yeah. Of course, I've yeah. said with Gwen just recently, I was talking about mm -hmm. how I think you just don't ever you're just never impressed with your own story. You just feel like, well, that's just my life. That's just what it right. was. And then you get impressed with other people's stories. Like we got on here and you said, I feel like I'm sort of talking to a celebrity. And I'm like, well, whatever. It's not. I mean, it's just me. It's a little yeah. girl from small town Iowa. It's not. <laughs> yeah. But not think anything. of all the people like you've reached. I was so thankful when I found your podcast. I was doing... um kind of home hospice at the time. So I was driving a lot at night and I would have your podcast on and I would just be like smiling and nodding and just feeling like I wasn't alone or crazy. So I loved it. I know it is really nice to not feel so alone because it is a mm -hmm. very isolating feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of advice do you feel like you might want to share with uh, our listeners today? Oh, um, you know, it's just kind of just cherishing the memories you, you, you had. Um, you know, I, I can say I didn't, I always knew I probably wouldn't see Martin at 80, but I definitely wasn't ready for just 18 years, but I just look at those 18 years and I just, I even from the stories I've heard on your podcast, I just feel like our kids' lives were so fulfilling and it's yeah. just interesting. So I feel like it's like sometimes we need to not focus on what we missed or what yes. we anticipated missing, but like what what we got and like what a beautiful like moment in time we had mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, that's a great point because it is easy to think about all the time that you missed and the things mm -hmm. that you didn't have that you won't see him go to college and didn't see him graduate and won't see the grandchildren, all those things. It's easy to concentrate on the things you don't have. It's sometimes harder to go back and say, oh, but look at this, look at this memory. Let's think of this time. Think, think of those sweet moments and just cherish them and hold them and feel blessed that you had them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I think about you with how happy you were with those couple little weeks that you guys had as a family of four. And for you to think about that in, in that sense, instead of the sense of all Martin has missed out on little Marley, the, just the mm -hmm. blessing that they had some of that time together. Yeah. You really exactly. are an inspiration, honey. I know you might not feel like <laughs> it, but it, it, is powerful. You and Martin both are, have a powerful story. And, and I love too, how you have really, you know, we talked about purpose, finding purpose and meaning making and post-traumatic growth. And you're just a shining example of that in what you've been able to do and kind of help other people and be there when they're in their dark times. And I know in your behavioral health practice with nursing, you're going to be able to do the same thing for them too. So bless you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing Martin and sharing all of that. I can't wait to have you send me some pictures. We've got to see some pictures yes. of him with the, 
Maybe uh, maybe that Super Bowl picture. I bet there's something fun there. <laughs> Oh, so most all of you make yep. sure you go to the website at andysmom.com because, or sign up for the email list. Cause if you sign up for the email list, then you get the pictures emailed to you every week, along with a little writing and the, and the, um, link to the episode. So you can see all of that there. So thank you so much, Joni. Thank you, Marcy. This was wonderful. Mm-hmm. It was a pleasure yeah. talking with you. Thanks for listening to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. We are always looking for new show ideas. If you'd like to be a guest, know someone who'd be a great guest, or have a show idea, please email us at marcy at andysmom.com. Be sure to visit the webpage, andysmom.com, for more content, including Marcy's blog. There you can also sign up to receive updates via email. Together, let's work to inspire hope, one day at a time.